Hello and welcome to our program Where God Weeps, a program where we speak about the situation of the suffering and persecuted church around the world. Normally in this program we speak about a country and the situation of the Catholic Church in that country. But today we're going to be speaking about a continent, in this case the continent of Africa, home to over one billion people, of which 200 million are Catholics. Now we have to consider that at the beginning of the 20th century, the Catholics numbered only 2 million. Today, 200 million. We see the explosive growth of the faith in this part of the world. To tell us more about the story of the Catholic Church in Africa, it's my great privilege to welcome Bishop Joseph Marie de Ocala. He is the new bishop of the Mbalmayo Diocese in Cameroon, in Africa. Your Excellency, thank you for being with us today in our program. Thank you for uh, giving me this possibility to share a little bit of my African experience, church experience with you. Your Excellency, precisely, we want to talk about the church in Africa. The faith has exploded, according to our research, uh, a new study that's been done. Since 1980, the growth of the Catholic Church in Africa has been something like 238%. To what can we attribute this extraordinary growth of Catholic faith in Africa? How should I put this? I think, first of all, there is this, let us say, context of African religiosity. There's a kind of background that African is has a sort of reserve of faith, of religiosity. But also, I think, in the last 30 years, the inputs of uh, the Catholic Church, for example, dealing with uh, the first African Synod, 1995, 94-95, uh, the second African Synod, all this brought some contributions really to make active a living faith in African church. And in this context, youth, lay people, religious, missionaries, priests, really find it as a commitment to bring more a living church in Africa. What is this spiritual reserve that you mentioned? What is, the, is it some special gift that has been given to Africa? I would say uh, this gift of the creation. Uh, the Lord gave uh, the humankind this gift of uh, worshipping, celebrating, considering ourselves and everybody as a family of God. And therefore, it remains a reserve, a positive one, to maintain those values, spiritual values uh, in humanity. You mentioned the Synod for Africa. You were invited uh, twice, I believe, uh, once in 2009, at which point Pope Benedict spoke about, and I quote here, he mentioned Africa as being an immense spiritual lung for a world, a humanity, that appears to be in a crisis of faith and hope. First of all, the question of the crisis of faith and hope, how do you see this? And secondly, what can Africa do? What is this spiritual lung that Africa can bring to the rest of humanity? The statement of Pope Benedict is very important. I was myself blessed to be appointed by him at the Second African Synod 2009, dealing with peace, reconciliation and justice in Africa. And we can see that uh, hope and faith are really throughout the world in crisis but also in Africa. But uh, we have really to consider that in Africa, there is what I call reserve. Why a lunge of uh, spiritual spirituality? Because I think we still see in Africa crisis, but also solidarity. Uh, uh, the sense of worshiping the sense of really receiving the gifts from creation, the sense of communicating 
and so on. Not just individualism, uh, not just uh, carrying out uh, what one uh, wants, uh, but really the sense of creation given by God. Yes, and I suppose, if I might quickly interject, the family. In, in Western Europe, the United States, we are seeing an isolation of the individual, yes. the breakdown of the family, yes. and Africa is the one seeming place, yes. a continent where the understanding of the family yes, is still in this guarded. Context, yes, we do have to address this issue. When I speak of uh, solidarity, that's what that means, not individualism. That means, uh, for example, in my diocese, I see in various places in the city or in some villages how people who are in need, in poverty, uh, bring themselves together in solidarity and fulfilling as such the common will, the common way of bringing really some solutions to the challenging life in all day lives. The U.S. Bishops' Conference wrote a document, A Call to Solidarity with Africa, in which, and again I will quote, they state, Catholic missionaries responding to Christ's mandate to preach to and teach all peoples carried the message of Christian hope throughout the continent. These dedicated witnesses cared for the people uh, in all dimensions of life, spiritual, physical, and social, end quote. Although the root of Africa's Christianity may be the missionaries, and this is a question to you, yes. um, there are at the same time allegations, accusations, that yes. in the missionary work, the traditional African traditions and cultures were perhaps mishandled or badly handled or, or abused. Mm -hmm. My question to you, the role of missionaries in Africa, positive, negative? My point of view is balanced. That means that the missionaries, they brought to us, they brought to Africa the gospel. They brought to Africa what we say, the revelation of God's love. And this is for me enormous. This is very important. So we cannot, this issue of uh, uh, the American bishops, I think it's really important. I have been dealing with uh, mission history, missiology, and so on. We have really to distinguish. Uh, they had some problems, uh, but uh, uh, generally and fundamentally, the missionary brought the gospel. They brought uh, the love of God to make it clear for, I'm happy to be Christian, to be ha having become a priest as a bishop, and I would say it's now to the Africans, really, to bring the gospel to the roots of culture. Uh, it's uh, another period. But the first period, it's very important. I will remember the calling of Paul, uh, Pope Paul VI when he spoke 1969 in Kampala, Uganda, uh, in Africa Terrarum. You African, you receive from the missionaries, now you have uh, to work out becoming missionaries for yourself. I think we need both. Uh, we cannot just uh, criticize, being criticizing the missionaries, uh, forgetting that they brought the gospel. At great sacrifice. At great sacrifice. In those contexts, you know, we know what happened, but also we have really to consider what have been brought in terms of faith, uh, the gospel, and it's time now, in the last 50 years since Vatican II to bring this gospel really in the cultures of Africa with the challenges of justice, peace, and so on. Yes, and my question to you is this rapid growth, uh, like a wildfire, but the question is, has it gone deep into the roots of the, of the society, of the culture? Is this what you mentioned, the next period which Africa needs to confront today, which is the catechism, the, the, the understanding of the roots, the faith, the sacraments, into the, the, the deep heart of the people. The word church, but also the African Catholic Church. Since uh, the beginning of the 60s, let me set this, since the Council Vatican II uh, has learned really to deal with the challenges of all day life, dealing with culture, justice, and so on. So I think that uh, as well in Africa, in the last 50 years, we have already been involved in that period of uh, the gospel of the faith who is getting roots in African cultures and in all dimensions. That for me, when we consider really 
the first African Synod, Ecclesia in Africa, the second African Synod, and what I'm experiencing in all day life, in pastoral work, visiting communities, it's a living church, a living faith with roots. It's not just, you know, a decoration or a theater. No, this faith is already giving response and solution to all day life, to worship the Lord, and to, to transform our all day life in terms of uh, the reign of God. Yes. St. Pope John Paul II visited Africa 14 times. Um, how do you consider his a pontificate to the, this realization of the Christianity and the development of Christianity in modern Africa. This is a very important issue. As you mentioned already, uh, I come from Cameroon, from Balmayo, and uh, I was uh, blessed uh, to experience Pope John, Saint John Paul II in Cameroon. He came 1985 and 1995 to proclaim the post-synodal exhortation Ecclesia in Africa, who was signed in Yaoundé. So really what we experience is a faith which is a commitment, commitment in all day life. Pope John Paul II taught us that faith is not a matter, you know, of a private one. Uh, it's really social, uh, it's public. It has to bring a new word in terms of the gospel, in terms of receiving the love of God. Uh, that is for me very important. That means faith is not uh, from yesterday, it's for today. And John Paul II, in his social teaching, in its way of addressing challenges of the life in Africa, bringing hope, really taught us uh, to bring our faith in commitment with reality, wherever. A bit of a more perhaps challenging issue, the fact of poverty in Africa. Um, the, the reality that Africa is abundant in wealth. Uh, you have gold, you have diamonds, you have precious woods, coltan, cobalt, um, and yet more than 40% of the population live in absolute poverty. Why this discrepancy? Uh, also in countries which are nominally Catholic, you still have this discrepancy. We're talking about the integrity of the individual, yes. the integrity of the politician. Yes. What's, why is it not working? Why is there still this disconnect? I see and I hope that the whole world is really uh, observing uh, what is going on in Africa. That means, how is it that uh, this rich continent uh, is poor? Uh, and the whole world, other continents, from Asia, from Europe, uh, from the States, they come to pick uh, what is in this country and people there are poor. How can you explain it? So I think uh, there's an international context, international interest, but there's also the challenge of governance. Uh, uh, of our rulers in African countries. We have to address the issue of self-enrichment. Uh, we have to, to address the issue of corruption and so on. How is it possible that those countries are said poor where they are so rich? Yes. So I think that there's a complicity with international forces, concern, and uh, 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 and the local rulers, when they are not fulfilling social justice, when they are not fulfilling their role uh, in governance, uh, and so on. Cardinal Sara said, "Cancer, the cancer of Africa is corruption. Mm -hmm. Why is corruption still such a cancer in Africa? Why are so many of these uh, weaknesses uh, still um, making the society so fragile? Yes, my question, I still have the question. Why this corruption and from where? Uh, so I really do believe that uh, there's complicity between corrupted local rulers uh, failing in their governance and uh, international partners. It could be even states. Uh, uh, Are uh, and this is really clear. Since uh, we see uh, this corruption is entertained, uh, this corruption has, you know, <laughs> um, protagonists who are uh, in 
and our sides. Uh, this is what I believe. But the issue of common good, the church 2009 addresses this issue. The common good is really a challenge from all of us. And the church has really to address this issue so that uh, our countries uh, could uh, perhaps uh, live more positively at, as now. I want to come back to the question of war, the cycle of war again repeating itself after uh, case after case in Africa, and the heroic role of the church. I think yes. that this is an issue that is not sufficiently recognized in the yes, West. Yes. I would like to quote a few examples here um, where uh, her, her, I would say heroic people of the faith. Cardinal Laurent uh, Passigna, who encouraged, for example, independent observers for the disputed election and re-election of President Joseph Kabila in the Democratic Republic of Congo, is one. Bishop Nikube of uh, Bulawayo, uh, outspoken against the corruption of Robert Mugabe's regime in Zimbabwe. And Archbishop Dieudonné Naza Palaginga, yes. excuse me my yes, pronunciation, yes. in the Central, Central African Afri Repu yes. Republic, tireless in the search for peace uh, between the uh, Seleka and the Antibalaka. For these church officials, they've paid the highest price, putting their own lives yes. at stake. And we have seen priests and bishops being killed yes, yes. precisely for this. Yes. Is this the cloak of martyrdom that the church must carry also in Africa for this greater good, what we've been talking about, the common yes, good? Yes, it's very important to know that uh, priests, bishops uh, are witnessing. They are witnessing the gospel. And for us, the gospel is really the Redeemer, the living Christ, the crucified and Redeemer and risen Christ. That means also true church history. When church has been suffering martyrdom, it was because church brought the voice of his prophetic voice, addressing issues of justice uh, and so on. Church in Africa as well has an agenda since 2009. Uh, the role and the contribution of the church to justice, to peace and reconciliation. And you see that in the last uh, years, uh, eight years, since the African Synod, the Second African Synod, this is what uh, the bishops and priests and the community are trying to fulfill. Justice, and as we know now, they can be killed for this. Peace, in order to bring people together. Reconciliation, all people don't want re reconciliation. And that is where really the church in Africa has uh, to follow the steps of uh, our Lord and Savior, Redeemer, a crucified one, yes. martyrdom. And that's the front line the of price, the church yes. in practice. The price to pay. You have been very much involved in education. Yes. Uh, you are, I believe, working as a professor uh, yes. still today um, and have also been researching very much on this issue. I'd yes. like to bring a few uh, statistics onto the table here. Yes. Um, that 17 million of Africa's 128 million children, school-aged children, will never have the chance to attend school. Yes. What is the risk for yes. Africa? Yes. And what is the church trying to do? This question, Mark, is very important. In the last 20 years, I have been teaching, lecturing. I have been involved in education at all levels. Before I was appointed bishop, I was vice rector of the Catholic University of Central Africa, over 4,000 students. And really, my conviction, my belief, is education is so important for human beings, humankind, but for the society and for the future, especially for Africa. We, do, we are now really addressing the issue, challenges of extremism. Uh, and all those extreme uh, uh, um, through some practice and Boko Haram and so on and so on. Fundamentalism. Uh, fundamentalism. Uh, so for me, the answer is education. Uh, in my diocese, I'm a young bishop. In the last nine months I arrived in Balmayo. My, I had my first challenges was spirituality of the priest and of the lay faithful people 
and education. So we organized two days dealing with those issues. How important education is today for Africa, for the future. Otherwise, it will be an invasion of extremism, fundamentalism, and so on. So, uh, and we call for all, uh, if they have to invest or to help Africa, they have really to sustain us uh, dealing with this issue. This is my personal, really, struggle. I want to just confirm what you're saying, and, and because I think it's often not known enough in the world, in the media, about the contribution of the Catholic Church. And I want to cite here a few statistics coming from a 2013 report by the Congregation for Catholic Education. Africa accounts for 75% of all new Catholic schools in the world. Today, the Church runs almost 16,000 kindergartens yes. for 1.5 million children, yes. 38,000 elementary schools for 16 million students, and 12,700 secondary schools for 5.4 yes. million students. Yes, yes. This is the first place where kids, children, peoples learn to respect the other to bring their contribution to the common good, uh, to worship the Lord, to construct and to defy a society. Yes. This is very important. And really, this is my struggle as well in Balmayo. The average age of the African today is 14. Yes. What a potential, but what are the risks? Yes. Therefore, education, education, education. Could you represent uh, those young people uh, and this youth, you know, really abandoned to some ideologies, to some extremism, or to some fundamentalism. Therefore, it's just an appeal uh, to ourselves, but also to all the contributors who want another word, a word of justice and peace, a word of faith, really to be vigilant dealing with those issues in Africa. That is what we are trying to do. You have also been very involved in interreligious dialogue. Yes. This is 30% uh, of, uh, of the population in Sub-Sahara Africa is Muslim, mm -hmm. and Muslims dominate more or less the northern part of Africa, mm -hmm. northern countries. How do we address this question where you have fundamentally two religious traditions, which at their core are missionary? That's right. Uh, in the last nine months after my consecration, Episcopal consecration, I have been appointed, elected uh, president of the college, the, the Commission of Interreligious Dialogue. Uh, so I'm really involved in this interreligious commission of dialogue. It's very important. In the Cameroons, we do have the majority is Christian. Uh, but I consider your question and whole Africa. That means the challenge is there. We don't have any other ways as dialogue. Dialogue with those who can and who wants from Islam. But we also not know that there is some of those expression of fundamentalism and extremism. We cannot dialogue really with them, you know. Uh, but it's very important, uh, a dialogue in all day life. A dialogue of believers, uh, who know that their creed is to worship the Lord and also to, live, to love and to serve the others, humanity. Uh, so we have in our schools, Catholic schools of public school, we do have in the agenda of education of our states really to promote uh, the sense of tolerance, acceptance, dialogue, so that if we are at that point, we will be really also, we will have to fight extremism, fundamentalism, and so on. Precisely this question, radical Islam is unfortunately on the march, uh, supported again, unfortunately, by some of the Arab states, Saudi Arabia, etc., spreading Wahhabist Islam mm -hmm. into Africa. Mm -hmm. Salaf Salafism. Salafism and, uh, and, and at great damage yes. to, to the populations, populations which per previously were living at peace. Yes. Now we hear, for example, in Zanzibar, priests yes. being killed, nuns yes. who are unsafe yes. on the street. 
or in the north of the Cameroon, the threatening of Boko Haram and so on. Precisely. I'm from the Cameroon, yes. How do you address the question of radical Islam? Yes, how do those the words address this question? Uh, uh, for me, I will say again, education and also really uh, facing those situations that means not allowing, not allowing that the kids wouldn't attend school. Uh, because those people, they are also making their recruitment from those social situation of crisis and so on. Uh, uh, it's uh, for me really a challenge of uh, which word do we want and which means uh, we invest in order to educate, to bring about what is really religion uh, and not ideology uh, and, 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 and so on. Your Excellency, Thank you very much for having been with us today in our program. Thank you, Mark, for this possibility, this opportunity to share a little bit from Africa, from the African Catholic Church with you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today in our program. And if you'd like to know more about the situation of Catholics in Africa, the work of His Excellency in Cameroon, how you might be able to help, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.